Hey everyone, Sam Smith from Black and Gold Productions here. Welcome back to the channel. Today we have a really good video for you as Ben Kennedy, Jason Cook, and myself had the opportunity to talk to Adam Pellerin about his thoughts on the Boston Bruins for this upcoming season. And we got some really good stuff. We talked about Brad Marchand. We talked about Jonas Corposalo, Trent Frederick, Jim Montgomery. We also talked about, of course, the Jeremy Swayman situation. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure to please smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, make sure you turn on your post notifications so that you never miss when we go live or upload here on the channel. For now, let's send it to the interview with Adam Pellerin. We are here with Adam Pellerin from Nesson. Adam, first question for you. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing great. You know, the calendar's turned to October. Regular season is on the horizon. And we're about to start having some fun at Nesson. So, yeah, I'm good. I'm good to go. <laughs> That's fantastic. So let's talk some Bruins. Um, we're a handful of preseason games in now. We got two more to go as of, as of the recording of this. Uh Based off what you've seen, are there any surprise players making the roster this season that are kind of under our radar right now? Well, I don't think many people thought that Brandon Bussey had a chance to make the roster at the start of the season, right? But here we are with the Jeremy Swayman contract situation, <laughs> which is obviously the biggest story here in training camp. But in terms of some other players that we've seen, I mean, you know, they they brought in Tyler Johnson on the PTO, and, and I know that we'll, we'll talk about him uh, coming up but um you know you can't help but but think back to Danton Heinen and and last year and how great of a story that was with him making the team and breaking camp with the team and, and being an impact player for the Bruins and you sort of wonder if Tyler Johnson will have that ability to do that as well and then you sort of look at um you know I, I think the the blue line is, is pretty much set going into camp. So I, I, you know, that that's, there are no surprises there. So you're, you're talking more up front and uh, you know, five out of the six, I think we're, we're pretty much etched in stone going into training camp as well. You're looking for that uh, second line right winger. And, and I'm not sure, you know, you know, that Morgan geeky will necessarily be the guy, maybe he will, but that position to me is, is still up for grabs. Uh, you know, just the versatility of this lineup uh, allows Jim Montgomery and his coaching staff to play around a little bit. And I think you've seen that uh, with, with Trent Frederick, uh, especially bouncing from, from center to wing. Uh, you've seen Kastelik, um, you know, bounce from center to wing. And I think, I think he's probably my biggest surprise. I, I didn't know much about him uh, going into training camp, um, but, you know, seeing, you know, what he's done over the course of, you know, these preseason games and the physical presence that he adds on the ice. I mean, he's always in the mix. Like every time there's a scrum on the ice and he's there, I mean, he's involved. Um, so he's been a lot of fun to watch and just the size of the Bruins, you know, and, and I think that was a big storyline going into the year as well. The, the size of the team, Max Jones, uh, Mark Kastelik, and you add that to what you already had and, and, and Morgan Geeky and Trent Frederick and some size uh, up front there, not to mention, uh, you know, Nikita Zadorov in the back end. So, um, you know, there, there's been uh, more than a few storylines uh, in training camp, but I, I would say that he asked me, you know, if there are any surprises, I, I would say Mark Castle. Like, I, I didn't realize, uh, you know, we we're getting that kind of player here in Boston. Fantastic. Jason? Yeah, and I, I want to go a little deeper on Tyler Johnson. Obviously, this is a guy who's won a couple cups with the Lightning experience you know a pretty long career um scored a goal last night he's looked pretty good do you think this is someone the Bruins will bring on their roster right away or do you see him hanging around kind of like they did with Heinen and they didn't bring him up until a couple weeks or months into the season whatever it was yeah you know it's it's a great question and I think you know you look at Tyler Johnson's resume obviously it stands out right because of the first nine years of his career in Tampa, the 420 goal seasons, the uh, the two Stanley Cups with the Lightning, the last three seasons obviously not playing on a, on a good Chicago team and the numbers weren't there. But, you know, you bring a guy like that in with veteran experience, with playoff pedigree, and, you know, as a head coach, that has to be appealing, right? It, it, that has to be something that you want in the room. 
uh, because a guy that's been in the trenches before, um, you know, and, and, and I, I think he, he's performed pretty well in the preseason, obviously the power play goal uh, the other night against the Flyers. Um, but he's done some some veteran type things on the ice, right? Coming back for uh, for pucks, uh, looking for open space on the ice, you know, just just a veteran, you know, veteran things that you see out of a veteran player. That's what we've seen out of Tyler Johnson. So I think he has a real good chance uh, to make the team. And again, you know, we talk about versatility with the Bruins roster. Uh, here's another guy, right? The ability to play center or wing. You can move him up and down the lineup. And so um, I, I think he, he is an asset and it's it's sort of like it is. It really is Danton Heinen-esque in the sense that you have a veteran player coming in that you can just plug right in. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, what the Bruins do. Um, because you're also talking about salary implications as well. Um, I would imagine he would be a you know a, a seven hundred and seventy five eight hundred thousand dollar guy if he were added to the roster. Um, so, you're, but you know, with the Jeremy Swayman contract uh, still unresolved, uh, you, you have to you have to think that that's a factor as well. Ben. Yeah, Adam, and I think I already know how you're going to answer this, but a little follow up on on Johnson. Do you think? it would be more beneficial to add a guy like Johnson or take that roster spot and give one of those prospects a try, whether it be a Lysel or Merkulov or someone like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you really wanted either Fabian Lysel or, or Georgie Merkulov to pop in the preseason. And, you know, obviously, you know, the first game of the preseason, neither one of them, you know, really stood out and, you know, you think, all right, you haven't played hockey in a while in a competitive environment. And so you sort of give him a pass there. Um, you know, Lysel did some really good things on the ice. Merkulov did as well. Uh, you know, some things that don't necessarily show up on, on the score sheet. Um, you know, and I, I don't think Lysel did anything to sort of, you know, play his way out of the conversation. But again, you're talking about roster flexibility. And, and so maybe – you know, the Bruins look at it as an opportunity for him to play some you know, more minutes, you know, in the AHL and the American League. And um, and in the meantime, you bring in a guy like Tyler Johnson, who, you know, you can just plug into uh, the lineup. And so, you know, I, I, I sort of lean more personally towards the veteran, you know, because, again, this is a Bruins team that, that's that's built to win now. And you want to add pieces that can help you win now. And uh, while I do want to see a young player like Fabian Lysel, a player that the Bruins, you know, spent a first round draft pick on a few years back, I, I want to see him eventually succeed. Um, if the time's not now, I, I don't want to see the organization rush him up. And, and and then, you know, the other part of it is, you know, if you call a player up, you don't want to you know, send them back down, especially a young player like Lysel, because that could damage the confidence. And I know that you, you know, you saw that with Beecher and you saw that, you know, with Mason Lowry, but, um, you know, Lowry had the college experience and, um, you know, Beecher had that as well. And, and, and so I think that, you know, for a guy like Lysel obviously goes from, from, you know, juniors to, um, you know, the Providence and then playing, uh, you know, here in training camp with the Bruins. So, um, I would rather see a guy like Tyler Johnson, who's sort of a proven uh, commodity in the NHL, but not to say that Lysel won't get his opportunity at, at some point. He probably would have last year had he not got hurt, right? He had 50 points in 56 games last year, and uh, had he not got injured, he probably would have got a call up. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him uh, at some point during the regular season. And yeah, we heard talking we about – oh, sorry, go ahead, Sam. Oh, okay. Um, we heard John Sweeney mention that, right? We heard him mention that maybe uh, if he had if he hadn't gotten hurt, he may would have gotten a call up, and that would have made things very interesting for the playoff roster. Jason, you're up. Yeah. So you just kind of mentioned how they want players who can win now. Obviously, you saw their offseason brought in Elias Lindholm looking for that two way center um, to play in the first line. They get Nikita Zadorov. Um, do you think this team is really in a position to be a cup contender? I mean, you heard Pasternak last week at practice. I want to win a cup. Cam Neely on Monday thinks their team is positioned to win a cup. Is this realistically a team that you could put the label on as a cup contender for 24, 25? I think that hinges on Jeremy Swayman coming back into the fold <laughs> for sure. Uh, assuming that the Bruins and Swayman reach an agreement, I think they will. I'm sure we'll dive into that a little bit, but, um, 
Yeah, I, I do. I, I do believe it's a cup contender. I, I you know, they they address the needs. They they addressed what they needed to address in the off season in terms of finding a a top flight center type player in Elias Lindholm. And again, you look at the numbers last year with Calgary and Vancouver. Not going to jump out at you, but. The playoff performance is certainly encouraging from Lindholm. And you could say the same about Zadorov as well. This is a, a, a big guy who can, you know, pair with McAvoy and, and maybe, you know, unleash some more offense uh, out of Charlie McAvoy as well, take some of the pressure off of him. You know, we saw, in the, you know, obviously, you know, it's been well documented about the Florida Panthers and their and, and their forecheck in the postseason and, and how that was wreaking havoc on opponents, including the Bruins. And so if you have a guy like Zadorov who could take some of that pressure off and, you know, allow the Bruins to have some clean breakouts and, and get into the offensive zone uh, quicker, um, you, you know, that that's going to go a long way uh, in a postseason run. And, 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 not, and again, we talked about uh, Mark Kastelik and Max Jones. They added size. They added... Uh, some sandpaper, you know, and, and you look at, again, the comp is, is the Panthers, right? That's the that's the defending Stanley Cup champ. And they have that grit and they have, you know, that ability to frustrate their opponents. And, you know, adding players like that, again, can go a long way in the postseason. So, so yeah, assuming Swayman signs and, and assuming, you know, Zadorov and, and Elias Lindholm they live up to expectations, they're, they're a cup contender. It, it's going to be interesting to see what impact Lindholm has on the Bruins forward group, uh, particularly on David Pasternak and, and Pavel Zaka and on the power play. You know, Lindholm on the power play, being in the bumper position, being a right shot, something that the Bruins had for a long time with Patrice Bergeron, you know, that that could be a difference maker. And and the fact that he can win faceoffs, you know, um, didn't have a great night in the faceoff circle against the Flyers. But, you know, you saw in the one power play opportunity, one of the power play opportunities the Bruins had, I think it was the first one, you know, Lindholm wins a faceoff and they were able to get, um, you, you know, in motion. So, uh, you know, we'll, hopefully, that, you know, that will uh, will prove to be valuable once the regular season rolls around. Ben? Yeah, so Monty, of course, he's going into this season without that contract extension. Uh -huh. uh, when he was asked about it a couple weeks ago, you know, he didn't seem too worried about it. Do you feel the Bruins will extend him before the season is over? And in your eyes, has he done enough to warrant that extension? Well, first off, I had to shut that light I had off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was flickering. I, I'm sure you guys saw that. It was yeah. It was it was flashing. I was like, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. I'm going to have all to get good. to the nice technical department and uh, <laughs> see fix that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In terms of Jim Montgomery, you know, you hope. So, you know, from again, you know, it's funny to bring up contracts being a distraction when we're right in the middle of the Jeremy Swayman situation, <laughs> but you don't want that to be a distraction. And, uh, you know, use the Red Sox, you know, as, as sort of a comparison. You know, Alex Cora was asked that question, you know, uh, quite a bit during the regular season about, you know, his contract being up and, you know, the possibility of an extension. And, you know, he sort of deflected and said that, you know, they weren't having that conversation right now. All of a sudden, one day they had the conversation, you know, that, that he's like, yeah, yeah, I just <laughs> signed a six year <laughs> contract extension. So uh, so it did eventually happen. I hope it happens for Jim Montgomery. I think that he has earned it. You know, I think that there, truth be told, you know, I, I think there might have been some question marks had he not won a playoff round last year. You know, I, I think, you know, you have that historic regular season team, you know, two years ago with a first round exit, albeit against a, a, a Florida Panthers team that that went to the Stanley Cup final, ended up losing to Vegas. They come back the next year and they win the whole thing. Um, but, you know, if, if, if the Bruins end up losing – that series to the Maple Leafs in seven games, you might be having a different conversation um, right now. So I think that playoff series was huge for Montgomery. And I, and I think, you know, everything that you hear from the Bruins, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, a player like Brad Marchand or a younger player, you know, the, the, the one of the things you keep hearing when it comes to Jim Montgomery is that he's an excellent communicator. And that players know where they stand with him, and I think that goes a long way um, for the organization. It goes a long way for the players in that room. 
And, and so I, I think that the staff that he has around him, they, they, it shares some of those same qualities. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I think that Montgomery has, has done enough uh, to earn a contract extension at some point um, before season's end. But we'll, again, we'll, we'll see how these things play out. They don't always go smoothly. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> Adam, we would all know about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jason, what do you got? Uh, I mean, yeah, kind of the perfect segue off that. The big elephant in the room regarding this team is obviously Jeremy Swayman. Um, you know, we go the whole summer. We're, we're kind of hearing from both sides that, you know, it's going to get done. It's going to get done. All of a sudden, training camp rolls around. It's not done. Um and obviously things have I've kind of taken a dramatic rise this this past week with you know with Neely saying I have 64 million reasons why I'd be playing. You get Lewis Gross saying that offer never happened. I mean, this is just kind of taken an extra step that I don't think anyone really anticipated. But where where do you think, you know, on Wednesday, October 2nd, obviously he has a December 1st deadline. Where do you see this going in the future? Do you do you see a deal getting done? So I do see a deal getting done. And it might be a while before we see a deal getting done, but I do think eventually the two sides will come together and and figure something out based on reports. The earlier reports, there was an indication that the two sides weren't close. I think that the reports that are coming out now would indicate that they are a little bit closer, right? The report that it's the you know between the high sevens and the mid eights in terms of average annual value. So, I mean, Don Sweeney talked about bridging a gap. So while that is a gap, that's still better mm -hmm. than previous reports indicated. So I'm hopeful in that regard. Jeremy Swayman, we had him on the Jimmy Fun Telethon. He came on, didn't want to spend too much time talking about that, but had to ask him the question. And he was confident that, that the Bruins, uh, that, that, that he would sign a con that he would be a Boston Bruin and he would play goaltender for the Boston Bruins uh, this season and beyond. So he was confident this summer. The Bruins seemed confident this summer. I know that confidence has wavered from our perspective based on the fact that this has dragged out for as long as it has. But I do believe that both sides want to get the this done and both sides want it to be a long-term contract. And I think what you saw in the press conference the other day was, you know, just a, a, maybe a, a human reaction, some natural frustration that, uh, you know, that nothing, you know, that, that, that this is still uh, a talking point uh, with a week to go till the regular season starts and you don't have your starting goaltender locked down. So, um, you know, as, as long as the, the conversation continues between the two sides, which I'm hopeful that will, I, I believe that it will. Um, maybe this was in some ways a good thing to sort of light some fires underneath some people and, and, and get motivated to get something done. So while it, ha it doesn't look good <laughs> and it hasn't looked good, um, I, I do believe that they're going to bridge that gap. They're going to find some sort of resolution and Jeremy Swayman will sign a long, long-term contract to be uh, the starting goaltender for the Boston Bruins. That is all of our hopes at this moment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that the, hopefully they can bridge that and get that done. Speaking of, of starting goaltenders, um, Jim Montgomery coming out on during that press conference and saying that as of right now, Jonas Corposalo is the starting goaltender for this team acquired in the Linus Ulmark deal over the summer. Uh, in your eyes, what should Bruins fans expect more out of Jonas Corposalo this upcoming year? Saves. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Didn't see a lot of them in Ottawa. And, you know, naturally that's not all on him based on what he had in front of him. That was, that was a bad Ottawa Senators team. And so you're hoping that a change of scenery, you're hoping that, uh, decor that is much better, one of the best mm -hmm. in the National Hockey League will help Corposalo. You're hoping that one of the best goalie gurus, if not the best goalie guru in the history of the game, goalie Bob, Bob Asenza, 
um, and Mike Dunham uh, can look at Corpus Allo, and they have been watching a lot of tape to try and break down his game and ways he can get better. And you can look at history of success with Corpus Allo during, you know, at points in his career. Um, you know, obviously it was what it was with Ottawa last year, but he, he, you know, he started 55 games, you know, and, and assuming Swayman, you know, comes back, you know, sooner rather than later, Corpus Allo is not going to see that number of games. So a, a smaller um, workload. And, you know, I think a lot of people have pointed to, you know, his performance against, uh, or I should say with the Kings uh, a few years ago and a pretty good playoff run with the Blue Jackets uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, he had, he had some success. This is an NHL goaltender. And, you know, it's funny talking to him. It's just like that, that, that he has that finished calm about him, right? You sort of talk to him and he's got that, you know, sort of calm, cool. Yep. Just have to make a couple adjustments. Be fine. You know, taking it day by day. No, the swimming thing doesn't bother me. You know, I mean, it's like talking to Tuca, uh, you know, like it was a, that kind of sort of matter of fact, like, uh, yeah, no big deal. Everything's going to be fine. No big deal. We'll be good. So um, hopefully, you know, that mentality helps, helps him playing in a market like Boston. You know, um, and and obviously having a better team in front of him uh, with a with an outstanding goalie coach and goalie Bob uh, can help him as well. Jason. Yeah. Speaking of the you know, Boston market, Brad Marchand was listening to the Nesson broadcast last night. They said he's the longest tenured Boston athlete. This is his 16th year <laughs> with the team. Um, obviously coming off a little rough offseason you know, with three surgeries. Um little illness last night. I don't think that's too severe, but I mean, do you see a point in his career where you might start to see an offen offensive production downfall or do you think that Martian still has a lot to give um, to this team? Well, they do need him. I can tell you that they need him to be productive. Um, you know, eventually it's, it's gonna, there, you're going to see a drop off. Maybe, maybe you already did, you know, this past year. I mean, it's 67 points. I think in 82 games, uh, 29 and, and 38, I believe was the number for him last year. Um, but the but the thing about Brad Marchand is, you know, while the 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 offensive production from a, a you know points uh, you know perspective might might slide, having him on the ice is so important for this team. Having his, his leadership is so important for this team, and you know, not to mention the fact that. You know, he, he, he fills so many roles for for the Bruins, you know, uh, special teams on the power play, on the penalty kill, um, you know, his, his vocal leadership on the ice, um, his his tenacity, you know, a lot of questions about, you know, you know, when he was named captain last year, you know, how he would balance, you know, playing his game versus being being a leader. And I think that, you know, at, at times last year, admittedly so, he – he sort of struggled with that. He wasn't sure, you know, if he could still be who he was fully and be the captain. And so I think that, you know, as the season went on and, you know, and as he, as he learned how to sort of fill the, the shoes of Patrice Bergeron and Zdeno Chara, um, you know, he had to make that adjustment. So um, I, I do think that he can be a very productive player uh, for the Bruins. I, I, I don't know necessarily if we'll ever see 100 points again. Um, from, from Brad Marchand, but, um, you know, we could certainly see 80, you know, it could certainly, uh, you know, push for 85, 90, um, out of him, uh, you know, uh, you know, considering he's healthy. And so, you know, I think one thing you, you sort of look at as well is Patrice Bergeron's last year. We didn't know it at the time, but it was his last year. Um, there was some load management there, not in terms of games played, but in terms of practices, right? You wouldn't see Bergeron on the ice for, for practices. He takes some time off. And I think, you know, as much as, as, as Brad and, and his, his personality, you know, wants to be on the ice every single day, you know, that's when, you know, the team has to step in um, and the medical staff has to step in and say, you, you know what, like, let's, let's sit this one out, you know, let's sit this practice out. You know, you got to keep this guy upright. You got to keep him healthy uh, going into the postseason. That's certainly the most important thing. So, um, you know, health withstanding, I think you, you still have a very, very uh, productive offensive player on the ice. Ben? 
Yeah, let's uh, move on to Trent Frederick. Uh, of course, last couple of years, we've seen him kind of ascend in his offensive game. 17 goals two years ago, 18 this past year. What are your thoughts on him, and where do you think his game can go from here? Well, you got a player who's going to be motivated to get paid, right? I mean, he's an unrestricted free agent at the end of the year, and, and there's something to be said about that. That can go uh, you know, both ways too, right? And player puts too much pressure on themselves and, you know, gripping the stick a little bit too tight. And so, you know, you hope that, um, you know, Trent Frederick, you know, is, is, is playing loose and, and playing his game this year. Um, you know, career highs across the board last year, 18 and 22, um, you know, a time on ice career high, uh, saw some time on the PK uh, this preseason uh, seeing some time, on the power play as well, uh, you know, so, you know, if he gets that opportunity on the power play, you're going to see the point production go up and and that's, and, and that could be a, a big thing for him. Uh, it's all about confidence uh, with, with Trent Frederick and, and, and Jim Montgomery had said this the other day is that, you know, he, he needs to be confident in, in himself. He has tools. I mean, the size, the speed, some skill, um, that we saw at times last year, or some some of the goals he scored uh, were pretty impressive, um, you know. But but he, you know, Montgomery is, is saying, look, this is got to be uh, he's got to be se- he's got to be more selfish, and he's such a great teammate, but he's got to be more selfish, not not from the sense of not passing and or, or you know or, or whatever, um, but m- more from the standpoint that you know he needs to be confident that he can be a game changer. You know, because he has the ability to do that. And, you know, his versatility is is a strength of his as well. It's something that he said the other day he takes pride in, you know, the ability to play up and down the line, center, wing, is offside, um, you know, and that makes him valuable. So so I, I think, you know, you could, you could be looking at, a, you know, a, a, certainly a 20-goal score, maybe push for 25 goals. Um, you know, it just depends on, you know – it depends on who he's playing with too, you know? Um, but I, I think that he has that in him and, and it would be, I mean, it would be huge, uh, you know, for this Bruins team, uh, you know, if, if he could be that productive and this is a guy, you know, Barry Peterson, you know, it said he, he, he wouldn't mind seeing uh, Freddie play on the, on the right side of coil and Marshawn, you know, and that would be an interesting look. Uh, so, you know, it seems right now he'll be, he'll be a third line, you know, center wing, player uh which he's been over the last few years uh but we'll we'll see you know if he can if he can bring his game to another level i'll, I'll say this and you know we talked about the size you know that the bruins had in the off season you know he doesn't have to be that you know quote unquote enforcer you know as much for the bruins now maybe he can concentrate more on his his offensive game because you have guys like castlick and, and max jones um you know and zadorov uh, that can sort of, you know, take on that uh, responsibility. So so maybe that will allow him to free up his game offensively. Two more questions here. Ben, what's your what's your uh, final question here? Yeah, well, of course, I live in the Portland, Maine area. And so a little bit more of a personal question for you, Adam. I, I do remember you uh, working up here uh, in this market uh, as a number of moons ago, I think. But, uh, uh, of course, journey to Nesson, but what's the journey been like for you, you know, getting to where you are with Nesson today? I didn't know if Sam and Ben, or Sam and Jason, rather, were even born uh, <laughs> when I was working up so. in Portland, man. Like, <laughs> that's kind of okay. crazy to think about. I yeah. don't even want to know how old you guys are, uh, but I... Uh, I'm, t- I'm 20, so I'm not... Oh, here. man. Yeah, I'm what? college, Adam, so it's, you know... <laughs> yeah, so I started up in Portland, Maine in 2004. So mm-hmm. the year you were born, yeah, I guess. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, ben, you were born like a year or two before that, right? Oh, right. <laughs> I was, uh, so 2004, I was already graduated from college and married. At the time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm old. <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, I'm not too far behind you, bud. Uh, so, yeah, I, um, I had my first on-air job. In 2004, at WGME and CBS affiliate in, in Portland, uh, you know, I worked behind the scenes. I, so I went to Suffolk University. I played baseball there. Graduated from college. Ended up getting a job at, at Boston 25. Used to be Fox 25. Um, behind the scenes, um, had some uh, you know 
workouts, uh, you know, trying to latch on, play, you know, trying to get a, a contract, a professional contract in baseball. It didn't work out. Uh, decided I needed to um, choose a path, and I liked working in TV. Both of my parents worked in TV behind the scenes. That's how they met. They met at a TV station a long time ago. So I was doomed uh, right from the start. <laughs> uh, but I ended up, uh, you know, sending up a, a resume reel to. Um, I'd heard that the, the 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 weekend sports anchor at WGME and and Ben, you might remember Barbara Barr. I do remember that name. Okay. Okay. So she had left abruptly. And Dave Ede, who's still there, uh, was working solo. They they needed somebody, and you know, in this industry, guys, you know, it's it's timing and luck, a lot of it. And my timing was perfect, and so I ended up getting the job up there. Um, and I, you know, I it had the, it, it was great because you know the the Portland market. It, you know, as, as you know, you know, Portland's not very far from Boston, and um, and and it's like a it's like a, a they still cover Boston sports. So I got to do that, but I also got to cover local sports, uh, local colleges and high schools and cover all sorts of stuff. Racing was big up there. Uh, the Oxford 250, uh, you know, going out to Oxford, the Beach Ridge, uh, you know, the, the track up there. Uh, and then, you know, obviously hockey as well. And, um, you know, the Portland Pirates were were there. And they were when I got up there, they were the Capitals affiliate, switched over to the Ducks affiliate. And then there was the Lewiston Maniacs, uh, you know, uh, Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, you know, the Q. And, um, you know, I got to uh, to cover them. So it was it was really cool. And then ended up getting a job at, uh, back at Fox 25 in Boston, got into news, was reporting and anchoring. And then um, uh, ended up getting the job in Nesson. And this is uh, I'll be celebrating my 12th anniversary at Nesson um, next month. That is awesome. Um, you know, we were talking about me being in college. I mean, going in for sports broadcasting. So it's funny that you bring up uh, your path there. Um, you know, obviously, big changes at Nesson recently with sports yeah. broadcasting and stuff like that. Uh, Jack Edwards uh, uh. retiring here. It's the final question. Uh, it's going to be kind of a two question, two part question. Number one, uh, what are your thoughts on? you know, the big change in the Nesson booth going from Jack Edwards to Judd Surratt. And number two, what was kind of the impact that Jack Edwards had on your career? So, Sam, first of all, for somebody who's looking to get into broadcast, your transitions are on point, man. You too, Jason. You guys you guys are top notch when it comes to the transitions. Uh, so good good work there. Good work there. Um, so I'll, I'll start with Judd first. Um, Judd's uh, a pro. He has been calling games for a long time. And including here in Boston, you know, at the Sports Hub, as you guys obviously know. Yep. Uh, but what I, I don't think a lot of people necessarily realize is that when you travel with the Bruins, we travel, Nesson, along with uh, the radio uh, broadcasts, uh, you know, Beer, Bob Beers and, and at the, you know, Judd now, it's obviously Ryan Johnston, but uh, we travel together on the team charter uh, and we stay at the same hotels together on the road. So, so we um, are with each other a lot. We go to the rink, obviously, for morning skates. Uh, we, you know, when we have an opportunity, we we go out, we socialize, we go out to dinner, um, and and so we get to know each other. And so, so Judd and 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 Beersy and Andy Brickley and and the whole you know crew, we're all out together, and we're all you know at morning skates, sitting in the stands together, watching uh, things things develop. So even though Judd is you know, officially a part of Nesson now, it, we, it feels like we've been teammates for, for a while. And I think that that made for a seamless transition, um, you know, not only uh, with Andy Brickley, um, who, by the way, and I know you guys have probably listened. I mean, they, they've already hit it off. You know, the, it's, 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 it really is like they've been doing it for, for years together. Um, but also just with, um, you know, the Nesson teammates and, and honestly bringing in somebody who's calling Bruins games already. Right. So somebody who's familiar with the Boston market, uh, it's tough when you're coming in from the outside, as, as you guys know, because, you know, people, um, are brutal, you know, and they take, take things very seriously. And I, and I get that, you know, I'm one of those guys. <laughs> so, um, so I understand that, but, um, but Judd's been great. Uh, Jack Edwards, um, so obviously working at Nesson at 12 years, um, I grew up in Norton, 
um, he went to school in Boston. So I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a local guy. So I knew Jack Edwards before I started working at Nesson, uh, just watching him, you know, he used to be on channel five, uh, back in the day, he was on sports center back in the day, uh, channel seven, like he was, uh, he was, you know, a very well-known figure even before he got to Nesson and started calling Bruins games, but I didn't really know him, um, until I got to Nesson, but I didn't really get to know him well until I traveled with the team. I started, you know, uh, two years ago, this is my third season, you know, working directly with the Bruins. Um, I can't say enough about, uh, just an, a, a great guy. Um, and I'll, and I, I'll tell this story. Uh, so I was, you know, like I said, started doing some rinkside, uh, pre and post with the Bruins. Um, I had done some pre and post years ago when I was at Nesson, but just as a sort of a fill in for Dale Arnold, uh, but was really starting to become a part of the of the group uh, a couple of years back. Um, you know, did 25 rinkside games or so and like five pre and post on uh, a, a heavier workload last year. But but two years ago, you know, I wasn't involved in the playoff coverage against the Panthers. And so, you know, I was doing baseball, Red Sox stuff or whatever. But um, but Jack, game seven. Obviously didn't end well, but game seven, he texts me ahead of time and he said, Hey, Adam, um, I have two tickets to game seven and I want you to have them because you have been such a valuable member and a great addition to our Bruins broadcast team. And I know that you're not a part of this broadcast coverage uh, for the, for the playoffs, but I, I want you to have these. I want you to be a part of it. And that just meant the world to me, you know, and, and it just, and, and it's, and it's not an isolated incident. It's a, it's just an example of his kindness. Um, you know, I've seen him on a number of different podcasts um, following his retirement. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys had him on or not, forgive me, but um, you know, giving his time, uh, you know, to, t he, he loves to, t I mean, I bet you, if you, if you reached out to him, I bet he would come on, <laughs> you know, uh, he's that type of guy. So, um, so yeah, I, I can't say enough about Jack Edwards. I had the privilege and I said, you know, during his last regular season game that it was an honor and a privilege um, during a, you know, a hit that I did um, when he was honored pregame by the Bruins. Um, and, and it really was, I was, I was really appreciative and, and grateful to have the opportunity to work with him. Yeah, Jack Edwards, one of my broadcasting idols as I was growing up listening to him and especially during that 2011 run, man, that was special, very special. Well, uh, I want to thank you on behalf of Black and Gold Productions, Adam, for your time today. It, uh, it really means the world to us and uh, we hope you enjoyed being on as much as we had you on today. You guys were great. I appreciate you inviting me on. Love talking some hockey. Looking forward to covering the Bruins this year and and hopefully having a, a contract signed, sealed, and delivered for Jeremy Swayman real soon. <laughs> We're going to cross our, cross our fingers for that one. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. That is it for today's video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this interview with Adam Pellerin. If you want to see more videos like this or more interviews like this, make sure to please smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and make sure you turn on your post notifications so that you never miss when we go live or upload here on the channel. Make sure to go check out blackandgoldhockey.com so that you never miss exclusive articles about the Boston Bruins or the entire Bruins organization. Make sure to go follow all of us on social media and also, be sure to go leave us a five-star rating or an, and a nice review over on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and iHeart. I want to send, on behalf of Black and Gold Productions, a big shout-out to Nesson and Adam Pellerin for setting this up. We really appreciate your time, and we really appreciate this, and we hope to have more opportunities to talk to people like that soon. For now, thank you very much for watching, and have a fantastic rest of your day. And we'll see you guys next time here on Black and Gold Productions' YouTube channel.